May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So this morning, I am uh, going to talk about a subject uh, which I hope will resonate with you. How to live a victorious life. None of us likes to be defeated. And certainly we don't want to stay defeated, that's for sure. For all the Raptors fans, that was a very tough loss. So that's why I follow cricket, not... Uh, <laughs> but even in cricket, we have our losses, right? And uh, how to live victoriously, or I, I could subtitle it, how to live in freedom. How to live in freedom. Those were four great songs that we sang today. Uh, and in that song, O oh, Victory in Jesus, uh, I just like to pull out uh, one stanza, uh, and you can see it on the screen. O oh, victory in Jesus, my savior forever, he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. And that uh, hymn beautifully captures the desire of our heart that we want to live victoriously. And I want to give you seven truths by which you and I can live victoriously. I love alliteration, so each one of the words uh, is going to begin with the letter F. And by the way, these notes are available to you. I would love to see some of you take down notes. Uh, when you write, it gets sealed. When you write, it gets sealed in the heart rather than just listen. Okay? So I want to encourage you to do that. And here is uh, the first secret of a victorious life. Uh, number one, is foundation foundation uh, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know a building is only as good as its foundation so that is why uh, elaborate plans are laid to make sure that any building that is erected is erected on a very strong stable deep foundation so your life and my life has got to be built on a very strong foundation, not on sinking sand. So here are two scriptures I would like to highlight. 1 Corinthians 3.11 For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to make sure that we are building our life on the person and the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Lord Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount uh, gave us a parable or a story of two builders. And I'm reading Matthew 7, 24 and 25. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it will not collapse because it is built on bedrock. The storms are going to come. Our faith is going to get tested. And we need to make sure that we don't have a faith failure. And the only way to determine that is to build our life on the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So number one is foundation. Number two, to live victoriously, <laughs> we have to fight. Victory doesn't come easy. We have to fight from a position of victory to get the victory. So I want to highlight for you how we are to fight, how we are to resist. The first bullet that you see is we resist by submitting to God. Resist the devil 
and he will flee from you. Don't you love to see the devil run? <laughs> Sometimes when a dog comes uh, barking at you and you just stand in front of the fellow and say, Boo! and uh, love to see the fellow turn tails and run for dear life. And uh, that's what we can do to the powers of darkness. When we submit to the Lord on a daily basis, the powers of darkness are put to flight. We resist by submitting to God. But we also resist by being sober and serious. <laughs> now, I am a guy who loves humor, but you can't live your life on humor. There is solemnity and there is a soberness and a seriousness that must grip our life. So 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, Peter says, be sober, be sober, uh, think clearly, be serious about life. Life is uh, going by very fast and uh, yesterday is not going to be given back to us today. And uh, so we need to make sure that we are living our life very wisely uh, based on uh, the scriptures. Then we resist by being steadfast in the faith. So again, 1 Peter 5, uh, 8 and 9, the middle part says, resist him steadfast in the faith. Steadfast means no wavering. There is no fickle mindedness. I don't entertain doubt. I send my roots deep into scripture. That is why we have almost a 40 minute sermon on Sunday morning. And then you have your cell groups where you can go and study the word of God in greater detail. You have your own quiet times with the Lord because you want your roots to penetrate deep into the bedrock of scripture. And that's how we emerge victorious in the battle against the powers of darkness. Ephesians 6 and verse 11, by the way, that's a great passage to memorize. Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. For uh, the first three people who memorize it, word perfect, and say it to our youth pastor, he will get you some expensive gifts from the dollar shop. That's a guarantee, okay? I mean, the poor guy, he doesn't have too much of money, right? So dollar shop is all what he can afford, right? So we resist by standing against the wiles of the devil. The devil has very clever tricks up his sleeve and he knows which one to pull at any given moment. And so we need to stand against. It's like putting your foot forward and standing, uh, resisting and uh, uh, fighting uh, these uh, bullets that the devil would love to shoot at you and me. Uh, I love to do teaching on spiritual warfare. And in that course, one whole section is on the wiles of the devil. What are the tricks that the devil uses to bring us down, to lay us low? And we need to resist him. We need to fight uh, these arrows that he shoots at us. 1 Timothy 6 11 says, resist by being sound in the faith. Fight the good fight of the faith. There is a definite article there before faith. And that refers to the body of Christian doctrine. So you and I need to immerse ourselves in wholesome uh, teaching, in uh, <clears throat> teaching that uh, is going to uh, cleanse our mind and uh, give us a solid grip on life and also of eternity. So we win by fighting. <laughs> there, is, there are no shortcuts. Uh, you, ca you can't lie on a lazy boy and say, oh, victory in Jesus, it won't happen, right? You've got to be up and about, be thoroughly disciplined. And um, so that's number two, the second word, fight. Number three is the word follow. In order to be victorious, we need to follow. So 1 Peter 2.21, for to, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Follow in his steps means you ask the question all the time, 
what would the Lord Jesus do in any given situation? You and I are confronted with many different situations almost by the day. And the question you've got to ask is, what would the Lord Jesus do in this particular situation? Follow in his footsteps. 1 Timothy 6, 11, follow. <laughs> there you have the word again, follow. After righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. I'm a guy who loves a list. Uh, rather than just only give a command, give me a list. I love a list, a checklist, so that I can tick off. Oh, I'm, I think I'm doing pretty good on patience. Oh, I really need to work on love. And it's very helpful, and you find it in, all over the Bible, a list which you can use to see how you are doing in the battle. Here is another list, 2, Peter, uh, 2 Timothy 2.22. But follow, there is the word again, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. I'll come to the last part of that verse in a moment, but again the list as to what you and I should be following on a daily uh, basis in order to gain the victory. Foundation, fight, follow, and now comes the fourth word, flee. <laughs> flee means run. There is a time to run. And I was uh, amazed as I studied the Bible, how many times in the Bible we are told to run. So look at the verses. 1 Timothy 6.11 but you, man of God, I love that designation. Man of God, woman of God. The highest compliment that someone can pay you is when they look at you straight into the eyes and say, you, man of God. I mean, we have all these fancy titles today, pastor and doctor, and I'm not against it. <laughs> I love it once in a way, but uh, man of God. Flee from all this. <laughs> from what? Flee from the love of money. Right? Flee from greed. And every one of us is going to be severely tempted on these areas. Right? None of us are immune. The older you get, you think it is going to go off, it won't. <laughs> In fact, it intensifies. I can tell you that from my own personal example. Flee from all this. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee from sexual immorality. So how do I live in victory? By living a sexually pure life. In a sex-crazed society. All the social media is encouraging you, you know, break the rules break the rules. You're young only once. Go enjoy. But the Bible doesn't teach that message. The Bible says we have to keep ourselves sexually pure for the day of marriage for that one person whom God is going to show you with whom you can share life together being in the Lord. And again, what a battle this is. You know, sexual temptation. What a battle it is. For the men, pornography, huge temptation, right? And then uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 14, flee from idolatry, flee from idolatry. Now you may look at me and say, uh, Pastor Ben, I don't have idols in my life or in my home. You come check it out. There are no wooden or gold or bronze idols. Hey, but the raptors can become an idol. I was talking with a friend the other day and we were just commenting on the thousands who were heading to see a Blue Jays game. No, nothing wrong with it. I'm not condemning it. If I get a nice free ticket, I might come at your expense. But uh, uh, I was told that one hot dog costs $10 and one pop costs 5 bucks. That's 15 bucks right there. And you're not going to be happy with one hot dog and one pop. And I said, this is insane. This is insane. And uh, idolatry, anything 
that has your attention and affection is your idol. Two A words. What holds your attention and what holds your affection? <laughs> what are you willing to give for? That is your idol. Very easy to uh, uh, discover what your idol is. And there are idols in our life all the time. For me, uh, one idol is books. Over 40 years, I collected a lot of books and now I'm downsizing, uh, downsizing and I'm giving away books, right? I'm sending them to countries where the uh, seminaries can use it. So without my realizing it, it can become an idol. I love to impress the younger generation. Come look at my library. 95% of the books I haven't read, <laughs> but it is there to impress people, right? So what is your idol? What is your idol? 2 Timothy 2.22, flee also youthful lust. <laughs> youthful lust remain with us to old age. And as we feel sorry for the younger generation, the battles that they face, right? You know, lust means an inordinate desire for something, and I know this is sensitive, it includes food. North America is obese, sadly, and we have an inordinate desire for food. I did a trip to Australia recently. My goodness, they would give us a run for our money. Food, 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 food all over the place. Do you know their McDonald's has got six varieties of coffee? So my brother said, we are going to Meckles. I said, Meckles, what is Meckles? McDonald's is called Meckles in Australia. And you can't just go and say, get me a coffee. They'll ask you, sir, which of the seven varieties do you need? Oh, mama, mia, what is happening? <laughs> so they have a coffee culture and they have a snake culture. They love snakes. That's a story for another day. So flee, flee, run in order to be victorious. And here are some areas that are highlighted. Number five, number five, forsake. There are some things that you've got to give up, not just run from, but there are things that you need to give up in your life and my life. <laughs> the word for that is repentance. We repent every single day of our life. We have to. So Isaiah 55, seven. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. All sins begin with the mind, with the thoughts. And that's where the battle is won or lost. In the mind, in the thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and our God will abundantly pardon. Now here's a New Testament verse. Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Even the things that are doubtful. My mom had a way of giving me one sentence sermons that linger in my mind to this day. And one day I pu pulled out a shirt and I wanted to figure out whether I could wear it whether it will pass the test, whether it is not too dirty. So I held it up to the light, especially the collar area. My mom was walking by and she looked at me and she said, anything that is doubtful is dirty. You won't hear a statement like that from the seminary. You will only hear it from godly moms, right? And my sister jumped in, <laughs> as godly as you can find her. In my teen years, I really struggled. And she said, God is only a prayer away. Amen. Full stop. Period. And I recall that statement. God is only a prayer away for me to call upon him for help. Right? So, we have to forsake anything that is evil, inherently evil, or has the appearance of being evil. So, as you sit in front of your screen, <laughs> and suddenly you feel very uncomfortable. What am I watching? Would God approve this? What a waste of time. 
I could be using this time for something more productive and profitable. That is God speaking to you and saying, forsake it. Give it up. Right? As you mature, there are things in your life that have got to be, that have got to drop off. And you add things that will enhance your holiness. Forsake if you want to win. You can't hold on to sin and expect to win. Number six is fellowship. Now fellowship, sad to say, is not coffee and donut, although we welcome it. I uh, preach at a church every Sunday afternoon at 3.30, and one of the things I love about that church is after the service, man, the food. Grandpa's birthday, we bought a new dog, so we had to celebrate. So secretly I pray that everyone would buy a dog because it means we are going to have a feast. Right? Plenty of food. Right? So, and they call it fellowship time. And food certainly enhances fellowship time. You know what fellowship simply means? Fellowship simply means you open up your life with a, to another person. We have the Lord Jesus Christ as the common Lord. We have a common life in us, eternal life. Common Lord, common life, common love. God's love flowing through us. So we open up to each other. We share our life with each other. Right? So I want to encourage you to do that. Fellowship means you open up your life to someone. You talk about your dark secrets. You talk about your dark secrets. You ask for help. Right? If you just say hi, bye, sad that, that, that the raptor's lost and you take off, that's not fellowship. You haven't helped each other, right? So here are some verses, well-known verses, Hebrews 10. And let us, I love that word us. When you read through Hebrews, take a red pen and circle the word us. It comes repetitiously. You can't make it on your own. <laughs> That's the joy of seeing so many of you here on the Lord's day. We need each other. We are interdependent on each other. We are not independent. We are interdependent on each other. We need each other. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We encourage each other. We challenge each other. As iron sharpens iron, Every time we meet, and it may just be a one-on-one -on -one meeting, we sharpen each other. When I talk to people on a one-on-one -on -one basis, I encourage them to read a book. And I will highlight a book that has blessed me in the last two weeks. And I would say, why don't you read this book and send me in a report? General overview, what new things you learned, what you hope to do as a result of reading this book. That is what my first mentor did to me when I came to know Christ in 1973. He kept 10 books in front of me. He said, pick a book. So I closed my eyes. One, two, three, uh, all out but you, you know, you know, and I pulled a book. He said, okay, now do these three things. I give you two weeks. He gave me a love for books. And he was a Buddhist convert. He was a director of Campus Crusade for Christ. He taught me how to preach, took me with him wherever he went, gave me a love for books, right? So iron sharpening iron means, here is a book I want you to read. Two weeks deadline, and I want you to submit a report, okay? So I know a lot of you are going to make a beeline for your youth pastor because uh, he's the one who's going to hold you accountable, not me. <laughs> Okay, I come and go, but he's there all the time. Acts 2, 46, they worship together at the temple each day. How do you like that? Each day. Daily they were in church. We show up only on a Sunday morning, if, with a big if clause attached to it. Met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. What a beautiful description of Christian fellowship. Meeting in homes, partaking at the Lord's table, opening up your life to each other. Now the verse I said I'll come back to, 
2 Timothy 2 22 with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart that's the Christian body the church in order to be victorious you need each other those who cry out to God out of a pure heart I want to encourage all of you surround yourselves with prayer warriors I have got several prayer warriors around me. Next month, I'm going to Sri Lanka on a mission trip, heavily loaded mission trip. And every person I'm meeting now, I'm begging them to be part of my prayer team, my prayer army. And I will send them a prayer letter. What I'm going to do each day, cover me in prayer three times a day. So how many prayer warriors have you got around you? Two, three, with whom you share deeply openly honestly and ask them to pray for you and to pray over you you can't make it on your own whatever battle you're facing today you need help i need help and uh, what better help than to have prayer warriors surround you so fellowship to be victorious if you isolate yourself you're going to be defeated right and then number seven, number seven, in order to be victorious, you love this word, feed and feast. I wish I could have put another F word, fast. That would have been number eight. That's a message by itself. Fasting. I highly recommend it. And fasting not from just TV alone, fasting from food. I was so sorry when I heard Lynn Garden had closed. Pharmacy and Shepherd, you all know Lynn Garden? Okay, just one or two of you. For the others, I'm sorry for you. That was one of my favorite places for food. Their chili chicken was second to none, right? I, I cried when I saw the notice uh, that Lynn Garden was closing for good, forever. But you know what? There comes a time in life when we have to fast. That's part of our seriousness. If I really want the victory, am I willing to fast, forego food? But we are not going to give a full talk on fasting today for another day. But look at these two words, feed and feast. On the word of God, Colossians 3.16, let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives what is filling your life today sports studies hobbies vacations what is filling your life what is filling your thinking probing question probing question teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom that the lord gives now i'm a very practical guy <laughs> i could have stopped by saying feed and feast how do you do that so i'm giving you five d words please do yourself a favor when the sermon is over today go home pick up your bible in the front section there is always some empty space write these five words in big bold letters there are five d words if you are serious if you don't write this down you're not going to win i can guarantee you that sorry I can guarantee you that you will fail. What are these five D words? Number one is desire and delight in the word of God above everything else. I know for you young people, you have a lot of studies, you have to pour over a lot of books and all that has a place. But right at the top of the list has got to be the Bible. This book must travel with you to school to university, wherever you go. You must deeply desire and delight in the word of God. Do you know that in a Muslim home, the Quran is always kept on the highest shelf in the house? Why? Because they, sh they are showing to us, this book has got preeminence in our family. We are not going to put another book and give it equal standing with the Quran, way up there. Today for us Christians, the Bible ends up under a pile of other books. 
And in most of our homes, the Bible is collecting dust. And if we were to dust it, there'll be a dust storm. Very sad. Why am I saying this? Because a question I ask from the average Christian is, tell me something about your devotional life this last week. I read the Bible once a week for five minutes. No wonder spiritually you look so lean and mean. Five minutes for a whole week? You've got to be kidding. And you expect to win? Desire and delight the word. Number one. Number two, digest the word. Internalize it, absorb it, assimilate it. Digest it. Let it become part of your spiritual fabric. <laughs> Number three, do the word. Do the word. Do it. Obedience. Whatever God shows you in your reading for the day. Obey it. Right? Number four, depend upon the word. When you are confronted with choices, go to the book. And look for principles. Look for examples, illustrations as to how you can make that decision. That will honor God. Depend upon the word. And number five is, declare the word. Release it into the lives of people. Release it into the lives of people. Your fellow students, colleagues at work. Release the word of God into their lives and watch what God is going to do. Right? Before I pray, can we all say these uh, five words uh, together? I like to hear your voices. D. I'm sure you can take it one notch higher, okay? Okay, let's try it again. Good. 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 And so, Lord, we want to live a life of victory. And we know there is a cost attached to it. Forgive us for our laziness, for the shortcuts that we have taken, for our indifference, and yes, sometimes our ignorance. And today, Lord, we make a pledge that we want to be victorious and we want to apply these seven truths to our personal life. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful congregation. What a joy to see them. And I pray that this word would be sealed in their heart. It would burn in their heart and produce fruit for your glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.